Boy, do I ever have stuff I need to talk about. Impact, I just don't care anymore. Exactly. Yeah. I do not. I realize these things pass. Like, I, I've said this before that I just don't care. Mm-hmm. Many times I've, I've had that day where I say, you know, I just don't care about Impact. I used to watch Impact and hate the stupidity and get angry. Now I recognize there is stupidity and I don't care. Yeah, I don't care anymore. I mean, we, we talked about when we started watching this. The show I have zero reaction to now is Ultimate Fighter. Oh, I, 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 I still like Ultimate Fighter. I oh, like the show this week. Impact, I don't care. I'm going to review it. I'm going to point out every stupid thing they did. I'm going to try to not get upset. I realize this has happened before in the past, but it's just, it's just what it is. I don't want to say it's a terrible show, even though there was a lot of terrible stuff on it. It's just, it's just a wrestling show put together by people that have no idea what they're doing. Yes. And I just don't care anymore. It's always going to be number two, very, very distant number two. It's always going to be a show that normal people won't be able to stand. It's always going to be a show that has a hardcore group of wrestling fans who will defend it to their dying breaths because they're insane. And I'm just not going to let it bother me anymore. It's Let, let me tell you something. Last week when I went to Vegas and I couldn't watch Impact... Not for a second did I regret not being able to see the show. No kidding. Like, if, if this happened before, like, Raw won't record, and I'll, I'll be like, oh, my God, I've got I've to find a way to watch Raw right now. Or, or SmackDown, you know, I've got to watch SmackDown every week, even though it's, this past week it was a horrendous show. But NXT, I miss NXT, and I've got to find a way to watch it. I miss Ultimate Fighter, I've got to find a way to watch it. If I missed a, a UFC pay-per-view or a WWE pay-per-view, I'd have to find a way to watch it. I miss Impact, and I don't care. Like, not even for a split second do I think, man, I really got to watch that show this week. Nope. In fact, as I've said before, it's better when I don't watch it every week. Because, for example, this week there was a lot of stuff on the show where I had absolutely no idea what was going on. You missed one week, you may as well miss six years. Well, no, it'd be, I had no idea what was going on, and at least I could justify it in my brain by going, I didn't watch last week. Whereas normally, when I watch the show every week and I have no idea what's going on, that's when I get pissed off. I see. So really, I should watch this show every other week. And Even then that's excessive to me. I would just accept all the stuff not making sense, because in my own brain I could justify why it makes no sense. I could blame myself, for example. Instead, I just watch this show and I realize that apes write it, or or raccoons, or some sort of some sort of animal that's not very smart. These are subhumans. Goats, perhaps. I, I can't even I cannot even say that the people that write these shows are are Homo sapiens. I, I, I just even Cro Magnon, man, it, it would be a it would it would be a a uh, Australopithecus. Even that would be an insult to them if I said that they were writing this show. This show is written by rocks. It's written by roots. No, roots are at least uh, at least they're alive. Actually, I can't even say that because like a blade of grass never screws anything up in its life. It <laughs> yeah. grows and then it dies. Yeah. There, there's nothing like these people that write Impact. A blade of grass, as you noted, it grows. It progresses. Yeah. Impact is the same show every week for 100 years. I'm trying to think of anything in the world, like anything in the world that that was as bad as these writers would have long since become extinct. Something would have eaten it. Something would have eaten it, or it would not have it would not have have reproduced. It would not have have there would be no progeny. Is that the right word? Yes. They would have no progeny. It would leave no offspring. It, the, the, its line would end. But no, we. I mean, let me just let me just give you one example. At the beginning of the show, Eric Bischoff comes out, and a bunch. First off, he signs a singles match, and the singles match gets all fucked up because a guy runs in. So then Eric Bischoff, and then another guy runs in. So there's four guys in the ring. So then Eric Bischoff comes out and signs a tag team match. 
So he signs a singles match, and then he signs a tag team match. So then Rob Van Dam says, I don't want a tag match. Let's make it a four-way. At which point Eric Bischoff says, and I quote, I don't have the authority. He has the authority to make a singles match and then immediately change it to a tag match, but he does not have the authority to turn it into a four-way. Roots. I don't know. I mean, it just... <laughs> What's... We, it, it, we need to, is there I mean, a, how can you do something that stupid? Is there a culture that wasn't wiped out but just vanished? A lot of them, actually. Okay, well, that's that, that's where the Impact Rating crew is. They just have not yet vanished. It's just, <laughs> it's, that is coming. I, I, I hope. I re- It'd be something if the writing crew didn't show up and the wrestlers just had to put the show together. My God, it'd be a great it'd be show. Better. Yeah. Half Pint Brawlers is such a much better show than Impact. Sure. So he can sign a singles match, and he can sign a tag match, but he doesn't have the authority to make a four-way. When I saw that, I was just like, I should just shut this show off right now. <laughs> why do I? Why do I subject myself to something so stupid? I don't know. I mean, Vince Russo actually sat down and wrote that. You know what I mean? He actually sat down and wrote a character that could make a singles match and a tag match, but didn't have the authority to then turn it into a four-way. He wrote this on a piece of paper. Yes. Like, he thought it was good, and then other people read it, and apparently nobody said, no, wait a second, that doesn't make any fucking sense at all. Everybody else read it, and they were like, yeah, that's good shit. And then they put it on national television in prime time. So either, I just don't know how to explain this. This is like a logic faux pas, the likes of which I've never even seen before in my life. And I've seen a lot of them on Impact. I do think that Eric Bischoff realized how stupid it was. Because when he said he didn't have the authority, he kind of stumbled over himself. You know what I mean? I I think he knew how goddamn stupid this line was, and he still had to try and spit it out. (laughs) But, like, he just, he, even Eric Bischoff is not this stupid. He realized how dumb this was, but he still had to say it, and to his non-credit, he actually said this line. He didn't say, like, a four-way. Let me discuss this with Hulk Hogan. No, he actually said he did not have the authority. Let's talk about this show. I just can't wait. I have, okay. I just can't wait to talk about Impact. <laughs> we waited 37 minutes now. What a stupid, stupid show this was. Sting came out. To get a promo, he started talking about strange times in TNA. He said, white is black and black is white. Indeed. Indeed. It is hard to tell who is good and evil. He said he owed nobody an explanation, but there was a meaning behind his actions. At this point, the crowd, which had been cheering him, began to boo. And when I say boo, I envisioned that there was a sign above the ring reading boo. And they all read it like they were reading a script. Boo. Mm-hmm. This is not passionate booing. This was phony booing that the kind of audience was doing. Yes. So he said Rob Van Dam was just in the way. He said there were no hard feelings. But when he won the title, the veil would come off of everyone's eyes and everyone would be exposed. This was one of those promos. I'm just going gonna, gonna to cut you off. You'll, you'll be talking about this promo forever. I'm just going to explain to everybody what this was. This was a deal where, like, Again, Vince Russo or or whoever whoever wrote this particular promo, I'm sure they had some grandiose idea of what this was all about, but I had no idea what he was talking about. Sting came out and said a bunch of words. He said a bunch of words. There was a lot of those tonight, actually. Just a bunch of words. This is not the worst example of a bunch of words promo. Came out and said a bunch of words, and then Bischoff came out. Apparently, people... St- I guess the storyline is that TNA thinks that people still want to know why Sting choked Dixie. Nobody cares. I'm just telling you right now. They never mentioned that, nor should he come on the show. I'm not saying you're wrong. Nobody cares why Sting choked Dixie. So Bischoff came out with Brooks' ass, and he cut a promo. And she nodded disapprovingly. And Eric Bischoff said a bunch of words. And... He signed Samoa Joe versus Sting. So, a singles match. This was the first match that he signed. 
So, of course, this match goes five seconds, and then Matt Morgan runs in. I don't know why, but I missed last week's show. Maybe this makes sense. Yes? I saw last week's show. It does not make sense. <laughs> okay, well, great. So Matt Morgan hit the ring. The ref did not care at all. He just watched no. this two-on-one attack. I mean, forget about... You could argue. I don't know. I don't know if a bell rang, so you could argue it was before the match started and therefore not a disqualification. But he still showed no emotional reaction. Mm-hmm. He stood there watching as two men assaulted one. Yeah. So RVD makes a save, and that's when Eric Bischoff signs a tag team match. In the process of making the save, RB, RVD threw a kick and fell down. It was not edited off. This is not a live show. RVD and Joe against Sting and Morgan was a match. RVD said he wanted a four-way, and this was when Eric Bischoff said, I don't have the authority to make that match. Let me talk to Hulk Hogan. So Hogan came out, and he said the four-way is a great idea, and then Sting just walked away. <laughs> He's the smartest guy in the ring. So Chris, then we cut backstage after commercial. AJ Styles is sitting on a couch complaining about a match he has that he did not, did not know about. Mm-hmm. In storyline, the wrestlers in TNA have no idea what's going on. Yeah, that's what's happening. So, Flair walked in, AJ bitched at him for a while, Kazarian walked in, AJ is jealous of the attention Flair's paying, paying to Kazarian, Flair also gave Kazarian a nice watch, he said they had a three-way tonight with Jay Lethal, told them to take care of him. Rosie Lot of Love came out, big fat girl, she basically does the beautiful people gimmick, she wears like, way too much makeup, way too much makeup, and, and not enough clothing, she, she wears underwear, or Panties. I don't even want to call them those. She wears she wears she wears things that cover her ass and her vagina. And there's also like uh, what do you call those things? Fishnet. It's on this large woman. So they actually showed footage of yes. her killing poor Daphne. They aired the debut video of her injuring somebody. Yeah, fantastic. So she comes out and has a match with Roxy. And keep in mind, Roxy is coming off an injury, and so they put her in the ring with a girl who in her first match injured someone. Mm -hmm. Way to go. So they have a match. I'm sure that Rosie has got a great personality. She's really bad in the ring. She's very green. I'm quite certain that if I walked in the impact zone in a dress, I could get a job. Yeah. They had Madison Rain come out and distract. No. Oh, no. She came out and hit She hit Roxy. Roxy in the back with her belt. And told Rosie to pin her. Rosie refused, and so Roxy big packaged her. That's what they said for the pin. So yes, <laughs> Rosie was pinned in her television debut after interference on her behalf. Yeah. So then she laid out Madison with the tree slam. So they've given her great Collie's finisher, and Borash then interviewed her and talked about how what a fantastic debut you've had. You laid out the women's champion. Yeah. After she was pinned. <laughs> so, it's amazing we have to point this shit out. She did a terrible... She lost the contest and then won a cheap shot. So, yeah, she she, thre- she cut a promo on the beautiful people about how they're taking people out one ugly person at a time. She said she was not ugly. She was big and beautiful. She jiggled her massive breasts and she walked away. So the lesson here was Roxy is higher on the totem pole than Rosie because she beat her. But Rosie gets a title shot. But Rosie is greater than Madison because she beat her up. Mm-hmm. Madison's the champ. Yeah. Stupid! AJ, Kazarian, and Jay Lethal had a three-way. The deal was that Flair was there trying to shout instructions, and AJ told him not to worry. He had this whole thing handled, so of course you know what that means. Lethal rolled him up for the pin. And then this was another awesome TNA moment. Flair gets in the ring... And he starts cutting a promo on AJ. He tells him he keeps fucking up. He needs to go home and regroup and not come back until he's got his head together. So AJ starts to leave. And as he's leaving, Kurt Angle rises up from under the stage. Too much shit going on at this point. That was all one segment. A a three-way match, a promo, Angle coming out, yes. So AJ walks past Angle. Angle proceeds to go to the ring and explains that he's going through. He's starting at the bottom. And since Kazarian is the number 10 guy in the pros poll, he is going to beat him at the pay-per-view and then go through the other nine guys. So he's explaining this, and Flair gets in his face, and Flair starts talking about how you, you didn't acknowledge me when you got in the ring. He then starts to cut a promo on him about how Kurt was a great amateur, but I'm a great pro. In this business, I'm God. And 
they found a way to make a Ric Flair, Kurt Angle interview stupid. Because you see, the match is Angle versus Kazarian, but they spent the entire segment wanting you to, wanting, making you want to see Angle versus Flair, which you're not going to see. So it gets better. Flair demands Angle hold the ropes open for him. So Angle does. And then Flair exits the ring and starts strutting. And then Kurt Angle, the babyface, jumps Ric Flair from behind and throws him off of the apron. And then Kazarian attacks Angle, and Angle beats him up. So, in the end, I have no idea why anybody would want to see Angle and Kazarian have a match. Because Angle made Kazarian look like an idiot, and he treated him like an idiot. And all I can figure is that, how could you write this on paper and not think that the end result would be people wanting to see Flair get revenge on Kurt? I don't know. I don't know. Flair's promo, as, as much as I love Ric Flair, he cut the ultimate bunch of words promo. He was. He said a bunch of stuff. <laughs> he started talking about respect. He demanded that Kurt show him, and I quote, Shawn Michaels' respect. Yeah. And uh, halfway through... Both had... Shawn Michaels and Matt Hardy were referred to, of course, on this program. Yes, yes. He, uh, because halfway they're through, the B show. Halfway through, he appeared... Well, D show, at least. But halfway through, he appeared to completely lose his train of thought and start talking about some other random subject. What happens when you just have to say words? You just have to say words. So, yeah, this is uh, no good. <laughs> this is the visual of Kurt Angle jumping a man from behind, and of all the scary things he could do, he just... Pushed him off a four-foot ramp and Flair landed a, on his feet. <laughs> on his feet and his nice, wide-open, cleared-out area to land in. Yeah. You showed him, buddy. Then we had AJ concluding that he needs to kill Jay Lethal to get Ric Flair's respect. I gotta kill Jay Lethal is what I gotta do, he said. Not Kazarian? No, of course not. Christine interviewed Mr. Anderson, who was gawking at her boobs and ass. She slapped him. He said he was an asshole. But then he said all these fans were hoping to see her tits and ass, so they were assholes as well. Fans chanted, we are assholes. He said it was going to be a censor's nightmare. Of course, they didn't censor anything. <laughs> so at the pay-per-view... Maybe the censor got fired. This is nightmare. The pay-per-view said it was going to be Jeff Hardy and Mr. Anderson against Beer Money. Because you see, he's friends with Jeff now. So Jeff came out, they bannered for a bit, Beer Money came out, they did promos back and forth, they Forever. got into a brawl. This was a uh uh this was the reference to it was a reference to Matt Hardy in the sense that Beer Money explained that Jeff and Kennedy didn't know how to be a tag team. And they said, Well Jeff, we know that earlier in your career you used to be a tag team with your brother, but everyone knows your brother carried you. Because you see, Matt Hardy in WWE is better than Jeff Hardy in TNA, yes. according to these heels. Yes. And um, what else did they say? His brother carried him and something else. I can't. I don't remember. know. They oh, talked. Jeff did a big V1, of course, yes, to all did. the fans. Yes, they, yeah. they talked for hours and hours and hours, and I didn't care. Anderson said something annoying. Storm gave a big hearty fake laugh and then jumped, and all I could think was, get him. <laughs> Just get this fucker. So, yeah, this segment failed. Jeff against James Storm had a pretty good match. He was sloppy in spots. And then we had the finish. Jeff makes a big comeback. He puts a chair in the ring, and he does his running body block in the corner. Because you see, you can use a chair in TNA to assist you on a move. You just can't hit anyone with the chair. So... He does this move, goes up top, Storm cuts him off, Storm tries Hurricane Rana, Jeff holds on, Jeff hits a twist of fate, Storm ends up distracting the ref, spitting beer into Jeff Hardy's eyes, hitting the whirly bird, and Jeff kicks out. They do some more moves, Jeff finally gives him the twist of fate, hits the senton for the pin, this was after Storm had attempted to use the chair, but it bounced off the ropes into his own face, so Jeff gets the pin. This was a match with two good workers booked by an indie promoter that doesn't know what he's doing. Mm-hmm. It's basically what this was. Speaking of an indie promoter who does not know what he's doing, as in the early portion of this match, the announcers were talking about the history Jeff Hardy and James Storm had. And they reminded me that a few months back, James Storm tried to light Jeff Hardy's face on fire. Mm-hmm. 
So we progressed then in the storyline from a fireball to verbal sparring. Yes. That is the progression of events here. Stupid. Robert Roode and Mr. Kennedy had a match. As Kennedy is getting into the ring in the middle of the match, Roode kicks the ropes into his crotch right in front of the referee, which is not a DQ. Taz, of course, tried to claim the ref was distracted, but the ref was, in fact, looking right at it. And then, of course, the finish was Rude sitting down on a sunset flip and grabbing the ropes right in front of the referee, who counted the pin anyway. Because you see... Oh, who cares? I'm going to tell you, because this is amazing. In TNA, the refs aren't worked incompetent, like in every other wrestling promotion in the world. They're legitimately incompetent. These refs cannot figure out how to not see interference. Yeah. Listen, I'll tell you this from experience because I've been a referee. It is harder than it looks. With that said, it is not this fucking <laughs> hard. Okay? You Listen, if you're a TNA ref, I'm going to give you a little bit of advice as as a fellow worker here. Before the match, Go backstage and ask the guys what their finish is. And then ask them if there's anything that they need you to know. Ask them if there's any spots where they need to be distracted. Once you know these spots, when they're coming up, don't look at what's going on. Distract yourself or have someone distract you. It's really not that hard. These goddamn referees see everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why do you expect this to change? Because They've been seeing everything for years. Even if you don't know what you're doing, even if you've not been trained by somebody who's any good, if you've been in the business for 10 years, you should fucking get a little better. These people never get any better. No. So then, Doug Williams had the best segment on the show so far. He explained that all of these Cirque de Soleil clowns in the X Division, he said if any of them wanted to take his title, they were going to have to do the old-fashioned way, the English way, hold and counter-hold, and until then he was just going to bring them all down to the mat and tie them up. Best promo of all time. It was very, it was so understated, but confident. He was not shouting. He was sitting back in the locker room at his feet up, and he was stating his claim very calmly, but firmly. He wanted to educate these acrobats in proper wrestling, not their selfish, attention-grabbing style. Yes. He thought they were doing a disservice to wrestling. And he said, I, will, he, I said, until then, I, I'm going to bring you down and ground you to the mat. Fighting words. This, is, this was phenomenal. Nesmond Wolf and Orlando Jordan versus Rob, Terry, and Abyss. This was a moment where I actually was kind of sad that I didn't see last week's show in the sense that I would have loved to have seen how they set this freak show match up. <laughs> Desmond Wolf and Orlando Jordan against Rob, Terry, and Abyss. So, I had forgotten already that Chelsea has to be with Abyss for 30 days. Okay, uh, I... I'll tell you why I forgot. Because... When you do the angle where the guy wins the girl for 30 days, I guess the idea was they swerved us. Because when you do this, the idea is that you have vignettes of what's going on. Yeah. So they swerved us by not having any vignettes. No, she just comes out of the ring with them. Yeah. Now, here's where I must cut you off. Because I know you missed last week's show. I did not. Last week's show, the last we saw of Chelsea, and they showed us video clips reminding us of this, Abyss bumped into her. She fell on the ground and was killed. She lay on the ground unmoving for several minutes until Abyss carried her to the back. Seven days later, she is just fine. Yeah. There are no ramifications of this, which makes you wonder, why did it happen? I don't know. So Orlando gets sent outside. And, he, and by the way, Orlando had pasties on in the shape of Rob Terry's head. Yeah. So he gets thrown outside, and he finds himself at the feet and the legs of Chelsea. And he becomes aroused. Thankfully, not physically. But anyway, you see, he's not gay. He's bisexual. So he wants to fuck everyone. This made Nigel McGinnis mad. Nigel is mad that his partner wants to fuck Chelsea. Which means, shouldn't he be mad at everybody in the company and storyline? Mm, good point. So 
He gets mad at Orlando. There's some distraction. And I swear to God, as I'm writing this down, all of a sudden, Rob Terry flipped Orlando over and pinned him. That is what. I was looking at my screen and typing, and I... The ref count of three. I heard the ref count three in the bell ring, and I said, "What happened?" And you said, "Rob flipped him over and pinned him." Yeah. And I thought, "Okay, I will just watch the replay to see what happened and how they set it up." Silly me, thinking there would be a replay of the finish. No, no, I I still don't know how this match ended. He flipped him over and pinned him. That's I all see. I need to know. Outside before that, though, when Desmond's promo when he cut Orlando and Chelsea off first, Chelsea slapped Orlando. Then Desmond jumped into action. He threw Orlando aside, said, stay away from my girl or whatever. Then he turned back to Chelsea and he said something along the lines of, I don't know if he wants you or if he wants me, but he's my partner, so you can't slap him. And then if this got him, it was awesome. And also, I will say, I'm going to praise TNA here. Or I, I don't even know whose idea this was. It may have been Orlando's. You know, Triple H comes to the ring with a sledgehammer. <laughs> yes. And, uh, Hacksaw Duggan had a two by four. Sure, and Finley had a shillelagh. Yes. Orlando Jordan's gimmick that he comes to the ring with is a shake weight. Yes. Which is a barbell shaped apparatus that is flexible, and so you grasp it in both hands like it's a giant cock, yes. and you shake it in a lewd manner. It appears to be a masturbation workout tool. That's, that's what a shake weight is. Yes. It's a real life, honest to God thing. And that is his... That's that is his weapon. Is his weapon. <laughs> that is fucking phenomenal. Yes. So anyway, I'm giving the show a thumbs in the middle just because of the shake weight. Just <laughs> because of the shake weight. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut, Indeed. so to speak. Indeed. And Orlando has found some before. We had another Team 3D Jesse Neal video. This is not Taker and Sean. I don't need this epic video package of this feud every single week. Then we have the main event. Sting versus Rob Van Dam versus Matt Morgan versus Samoa Joe. In a four-way, not a tag match. In a four-way. It was actually far, far less of a disaster than I thought it would be. Yeah. It would have been better as a tag, but as a four-way... It was okay. Two guys did moves. Two guys waited outside the ring. Yeah. Wash, rinse, repeat. They did, at one point, do a spot where Joe and RVD cleared the ring. They turned and faced each other. They squared off. They soaked each other for a bit. The fans were going crazy. And then the heels jumped them. You would think RVD and Joe were having a match in this pay-per-view, but no, it's Rob Van Dam and Sting. So they did the match. Everyone starts hitting big moves. Morgan hits his elbows in the corner, and then he gets distracted because he sees something in the stands. And he slowly walks forward, and he rubs his eyes, and he puts his hand over his eyes as if he is looking at something far away. And then the camera cuts to the back row. The camera zooms in. The camera has theoretically better vision than Matt's own eyes. And it zooms in, and I can confirm that standing in the back row of the impact zone was a man. A hominid. <laughs> there was... May have been a crow magnet. There was a creature that appeared to have two arms and two legs. Yeah. This... <laughs> you know what's great about it? It was supposed to be Hernandez, I think. I assume? But like, but, like, the announcers didn't know who it was supposed no. to be. Nobody knew who it was supposed to be, which begs the obvious question to everybody except these writers. Yes. If the man was so far away that with somewhat of a zoom in and and focusing on this hominid, the announcer still had absolutely no idea who it was. What was it that distracted Matt Morgan in the first place? Why, why is Matt Morgan the only person on earth who could tell what this thing was? This is not like... This is not like at Club Lavella where the wall was on top of that building, but, like, there was no one else around. It was a building, and standing on top of the building was the wall. Yes. Okay, you have to, you have to, it strains credulity to think that Hulk Hogan with his bad eyesight could see the wall on the top of this building a mile away. But if he had, you know, 15 over 20 vision in both eyes, maybe you could see that there was one man standing on top of the building that by process of elimination, in some way, he determined to be the wall. Sure. No. This was in the impact zone with 1,200 people, and among the 1,200 people was an unidentifiable man, and somehow this man distracted Matt Morgan. Yes. What so a Matt, stupid show. <laughs> Matt Morgan. Oh, it gets better. <laughs> Matt Morgan. Well, it may get better, but there's more. Matt Morgan is distracted. Samoa Joe. Hey, a man in the crowd. 
<laughs> There's a fan in the impact zone. What is this bullshit? Matt Morgan is distracted. Samoa Joe jumps in from behind and hits the muscle buster. And then Rob Van Dam lays out Joe and uh, steals the pin. These people are so stupid. I and can't the get show over this. Ends. Hold on. Okay. It would actually make sense if Matt Morgan saw Hernandez. Yeah. And he became distracted. Yeah. And he got pinned. But their idea was... We want the fans to wonder who that man was. Yeah. Not realizing that by doing that, you make the entire thing make absolutely no sense. They're retarded, Brian. They're functionally <laughs> retarded. Wow. These people can't tie their own shoes. So, yeah, there was a lot of stupid stuff on this show. So then, yes. So Joe lays out Morgan, Rob lays out Joe, and steals the pin. Building, again, to Rob Van Dam versus Samoa Joe. I don't know... What the fuck happened to Sting? He disappeared, but the show ended with Joe returning to the ring. Joe and Rob Van Dam had to stare down, and Taz said the following words I am not making up. What a wacky turn of events. I can't argue. A wacky turn of events to close this impact. So, yeah, this show was no good, everyone. This show sucks a dick. To the back! Usually I get home at like uh, uh, 10.15 and we start watching the show. I uh, I had a class. I didn't leave till 10.25. I was going to be late. I was ready to just call you and tell you to just start watching the show. And I'd be there in 15 minutes. I didn't need to see the first part. I didn't need to see any of the show, everyone. I don't care if I ever watch Impact again. I, the only reason I watch it is because it's my job and I should probably keep up. But And this was like a good Impact. Kind of. It's gotten to the point now where points. even a good impact, I just don't give a shit anymore. Yeah. Uh, eight years, everybody. And first off, by the way, this is Slammiversary 8, but they've only had six. Seriously. Hmm? Yeah. What? They've only had six Slammiversaries. That's their eighth But they're year? calling it Slammiversary 8. I did. <laughs> because it's been eight years. All right. Yeah. So, Slammiversary 8 is coming up. I don't care about the pay-per-view. I don't care about this TV show. It used to be that, like, if there was a good impact, I maybe my hopes would get up. I think, man, maybe shit's turning around. Never did. No. No. Me? <laughs> Thanks, Vince. Well, so, my, yeah. my hopes for this show died years, years before yours did. This is just a wrestling show that nobody watches. <laughs> nobody is ever going to watch it. It does not matter what they do. Nobody's going to buy their pay-per-view on Sunday. They did a bad job building it up for the most part, especially the main event angle. And we're going to talk about it here in about five minutes and then move on. The, whole show the, 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 the days of great impact reports, everybody, are over because I don't care anymore about TNA. Go ahead. Show opened with AJ Styles, Desmond Wolf, Kazarian, and Beer Money coming down to the ring. It was Team Flair without Flair. And AJ noted he wasn't there. Said they had an eight-man tag tonight, but there were five of them in the ring. Said there were four Beatles, the Fantastic Four, the Four Horsemen. And they only needed four men, so he told Kazarian to get lost. They started to bicker. Flair's music hit, but it was Jay Lethal doing his Ric Flair impression again. So he was he was being Ric Flair, being all nutty. He uh, introduced his team in the eight-man tag. It would be himself, Abyss, and Mr. Anderson, he said. And somewhere in here, as Abyss came out, Mike Tanay informed us that in three days on the pay-per-view, Abyss and Desmond Wolf are going to have a Monsters Ball match. Why not? Who cares? Who cares? Exactly. Yes. So they figured back and forth for a while. James Storm, the hero of the night, was standing in the corner, bored out of his skull. <laughs> I cannot believe this is going on. The baby faces eventually came down to the ring to, to fight the heels three on five. Jay Lethal did a dive off uh, from the ramp over the ropes into the ring. I need an enemy to give it this. It was awesome and funny, but there's a downside to it, which we'll get to later. He hits this big dive. Fight breaks out. The heels are winning. Jeff Hardy saved. Four men fought off five. There you go. This is fine. I enjoyed it. Didn't really... It, it was a great build for a main event of the TV. Yeah. I don't know why the match is the main event on TV. It doesn't matter. We had a Brian Kendrick promo that made it very clear he's using drugs. It was an Aleister Crowley type promo, and he's smoking too much weed. Mm -hmm. And Aleister Crowley actually would do a much better job writing Impact than Vince Russo. Just like to throw <laughs> that out there. 
Homicide and Brian Kendrick with Doug Williams on commentary. The best part of this was Taz and Doug Williams trying to figure out the proper pronunciation of roof. Yes. Which is, in fact... Now, it that is, is a shot at you. It is roof as in hoof, not roof as in poof. So I want you all to know that. All right. For those of people, seriously, that make fun of the way I say roof, why do you pronounce H-O-O-F, hoof? How many people do you know that say, look at that horse's hoof? No one says that. So anyway. Because that would be stupid. <laughs> roof. So they got a very long time. Let me talk about more about this match. This is what they did. The main event, the match on Sunday is Doug Williams versus Brian Kendrick. Sure. Now, as soon as I heard that, I assumed, okay, well, Homicide's beating Kendrick. Shockingly, that did not happen. However, Buds. Homicide beat him up for the entire match. Yes. He finally went to get a gimmick. The ref stopped him. Which was astounding, by the way, since the refs usually don't give two fucks about this sort of thing. So as Homicide is distracted, Kendrick blindsides him with a kick and pins him. Way to put over the guy for his title shot. Mm -hmm. They could not even let... Think about this. They could not even let Brian Kendrick decisively beat Homicide. No. Who has publicly buried the company. Yes. They could not even have him cleanly beat Homicide, leading to a title shot at the pay-per-view... That's how desperately they want to parody book this program. Mm -hmm. Stupid. This appeared to be an instance where they booked a match for the pay-per-view, and after they booked it, after they announced it, they then did a number one contenders match, as yeah. best I could tell. Also, there are three wrestlers here. I have, as far as I can tell, they're all heels. Homicide, Kendrick, and Williams. As far as I can tell, we're supposed to hate them all. Yeah. So the wrestling was good. Nothing else here made a damn lick of sense. No. We had... Dudes brawled backstage. That's all I wrote down. All right. <laughs> Did not care. There was, as usual on Impact, a lot of guys backstage yelling and fighting. They then began yelling in the ring. It was Jesse Neal and Bubba Ray Dudley. They were yelling at each other. The tag partners were out there. Jesse, in the middle of it, said, what is that thing with laying us out and putting cards on us? Bubba this had, is from weeks ago, apparently. And Bubba had no idea what he was talking about. So, yes, they, 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 it's one of those things they do once, never show you, and expect you to remember. Bicker back and forth for a while. Eventually. You know, the only reason I remember that is because we had a debate over who might have left the card. I think it was on a Dave show. I think we said it would be Orlando. Yeah. Yeah. So, anywho. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What happened here? I'll tell you about this segment. All right. This actually was the best thing on the show. Bubba Ray Dudley is the old, grizzled, grumpy veteran who hates the young trainee, Jesse Neal. He's a complete dick to him. Jesse Neal is all pissed off and rebellious, as a young fuck should be. And Devon is the veteran who thinks Bubba is too hard on the young guy. Bubba is awesome, playing the old, crusty bully. Jesse Neal is awesome, playing the young upstart. Devon is fucking awesome, playing the guy that's pissed off at the old, crusty guy and is trying to be nice to the young guy. These guys are all awesome in their role. And do I actually want to see him wrestle? No, but that's beside the point. They're all great in their role. Yeah. So, ended up with Shannon calling Bubba a fat bully and Devon a puppet. Devon said, actually, he kept his cool amazingly. He, he so told Shannon he didn't like him, but then he said he was going to give him a pass. And he said Jesse had a pass because he was a trainee. He told Bubba to get his head on straight, and then he left. He said, leave that kid alone. Yes. He, and he stormed out. He left, washed his hands the entire situation, so he's out of it. There, there was a point here where the, the, earlier the crowd was chanting for Jesse, and then later they started chanting for Devon. I was like, well, they've got everyone confused again. But no, they made it clear. Devon is not a part of this. Yes. It's Jesse versus Bubba. So then to make it abundantly clear, as uh, they were separating, Bubba blindsided Jesse Neal, and then in the best part of this entire thing, he blindsided him and then ran away. Ran for his life. That was awesome. Replayed the entire Sting Jarrett match from the pay-per-view with Sting just beating the crap out of him. And Tanae said the footage was very hard to watch. And actually, it was very easy to watch because we fast-forwarded through all of it. It helped a lot. Bischoff said he had a tag partner for Matt Morgan at the pay-per-view. Said he was going to love this to death. Love him to death. And that made Morgan freak out. Yeah. If that was a clue to Hernandez's identity, it's I don't get it. Jared did a pre-tape promo, saying he was going to get his revenge. It wouldn't be soon. He had his arm in a sling. He was sad he won't be at Slammiversary, and he promised Sting he would get answers. About what? 
Why he beat him up? Because yeah. he doesn't like you. <laughs> he's Hello? Mean. Because he's mean. Morgan came out for the tag match. Hogan came out and said he was a big, mean liar. Said all that energy that Morgan was putting out was going to come right back to him. And he said, does Viva La Rosa sound familiar to you? And I thought... Conan came out. I thought Eddie Guerrero was passed on. Yeah. It was Hernandez who beat up Matt Morgan, beat the crap out of him, left him laying. They came out to stretcher Matt Morgan away. He'd barely been elbowed so badly in the head that he was incapacitated. Sure. They uh, went to stretcher him out, but then the Wolfpack music played, because you see this was supposed to be a tag title match. And the band came out. They stood in the corner. Matt Morgan was laying on a stretcher in the middle of the ring, incapacitated. Theoretically tied down. Eric Young covered him, pinned him. This was actually pretty funny. <laughs> and yes, the funniest part was a shot from above showing the inept way in which the supposed medical staff had haphazardly yes. tied Morgan to this stretcher. Yes. This was very unsafe. It's to his benefit that the band ran out and prevented him from being carried out on this thing. I'm not a robber, but if I broke into someone's house and we're going to tie them to a chair, I probably would do a better job than this medical staff did here for Matt Morgan on this stretcher. Yeah. And he had, like, one leg tied down and the other leg wasn't. And there was, like, a random strap from, like, crotch to shoulder. <laughs> it was over his arms. Like, ridiculous. Okay. So, a couple things here. Hernandez came back. His big return of the company after being beaten nearly to death. And he, his, his enemy is in the ring. He charges down the ramp, throws himself on the ropes. It's a big, awesome dive. It looks really cool. But it's the exact... Same dive Jay Lethal hit in the opening I segment. don't even notice this shit anymore. These stupid it's, fuckers. Well, they just... They undermine their own big spot. I, I accept the stupidity now. I, I That one I noticed. So Hernandez beat him up for a long time. He's enormous, by the way. Yeah, he came back from Mexico, huge, jacked, and ripped. Isn't it amazing how guys always come back from injury enormous? Huh. Stunning. Injury in Mexico. In Mexico, yes. So, so he re- destroys Morgan to the point where Morgan has to be EMT'd out. And after we've already seen Hernandez get his revenge, Hogan books them for a match with anniversary. So he can beat him up again. I do like the idea that, that like, I guess Hernandez is happy to be Morgan's partner to screw with him. It's just like, Morgan tried to kill you. Why would you want to be his teammate at all, even to fuck with him? <laughs> I don't know, everyone. I we'll find he, out. He knew he would be in the ring that way. I don't know. There are worse things to hate on the show. And then, and then the band, uh, yes, they, they pinned him as he was, tra- tra- as he was strapped to the stretcher. Which was very stupid, but was at least very funny as well. So I, I, if you're going to be stupid and do comedy, great. We had an RVD promo. The show was like an hour old at this point, and I had completely forgotten he was wrestling Sting at the pay-per-view. Mm. To this point, they had done a lot of, to build Sting and Jarrett on this program. But no, Sting was wrestling Rob Van Dam for the World Championship, and I forgot. In the middle of this, RVD jumped Sting from behind, laid him out, stole his belt. Sting attacked RVD. What did I say? RVD attacked Sting. No, you're right. That's a big difference. Sting attacked is, RVD, everyone. That is not a nitpick. And stole his belt. That is an important correction. Then we had the best thing on the show in months. Kurt Angle came out, talked about facing Kazarian at the pay-per-view to win his number 10 spot in the top 10 Dealey Bob. He said that tonight he was calling out a friend to wrestle with him to prepare him for this match. The best X-Division wrestler on the planet to help him prepare for the X-Division superstar Kazarian. Told his friend to do the best he could and not go easy on him. It was the amazing Red. We got Kurt Angle versus Red. Red took 95% of this match. Kurt Angle sold, 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 sold. Every now and then he'd hit like an overhead belly to belly. And then as he went to pick the guy up, Red would hit him with about 75 other moves. Near fall after near fall. And finally, Angle avoided the twisting moonsault, hit the Angle Slam for the pin. There was a spot in here where Angle was on his knees and Red did a running Hurricane Rana and basically DDT'd Angle's head right into the mat. Suffice to say, this match was fucking awesome. Kurt Angle in this match looked like not only the best wrestler in the world, but maybe the best wrestler in the world by a significant margin. If he is going to be just having great matches with random guys every single week and working his way through the top ten, I will take back every bad thing I've said about Impact on this show here tonight. This fucking ruled. The only negative I would have is that it was like three or four minutes. 
It was a great Fear Four Minute match. There was no negative here, everyone. This ruled. When he announced he was bringing out an X Division wrestler to uh, prep him, basically, I was fully expecting to be fully expecting it to be Samoa Joe. I think it's going to do that match for free with no build. But no, it was Angle and Red. It was fun. They made Red look good before he, he actually put Angle over. This match was so good that when this show is over, I'm going to go down and watch it again. Yeah. And I can uh, count on one hand the number of matches in 2010 that I've watched twice. Oh, I deleted it, didn't I? You, your exact words were, I cannot delete this show fast enough. You had forgotten it by the end of the show. I had. God there, damn it. I'll find it online. There will be a replay. So It'll be on the TNA site right now, actually. Sure. Sting uh, cut a promo backstage. He said he was in possession of the belt, but on Sunday he will own it. said when he won the world title, the veil would be lifted. He revealed that he has painted deception on the face of the belt. This was the best thing on the show. And then said, and I quote, ooh, deception. Yes. Sting? <laughs> Sting was given a job he found completely ridiculous. Yes. And he let Earth know. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Sting knows how dumb this all is. He said change was coming. We then got a Slammiversary video package. They said Slammiversary was, and this is a direct quote, this summer's hottest pay-per-view of the year. Yes. So they said, yes. this summer's hottest pay-per-view of the year. So All they, right. They started talking about eight years of accomplishment, and it was Hulk and Dixie and Kurt Angle talking about everything TV had done. biggest load this of bullshit. bullshit. That's what I wrote. Never, ever have I seen such a load of shit as this video right here. So I was sitting at my computer typing, and, and because you were late, I had control of the remote tonight. And uh, you were sitting at your computer, and this video just kept going. We started talking about matches on the card. Guys were talk, cutting boring promos. It went on and on and on. And this is where... By this point in Impact, I was in a catatonic state. I was vegetative, like The Undertaker. And something occurred to me, why the fuck are we watching this? Yeah. And we fast-forwarded. It went longer. So this sucked. And we had the main event. AJ Styles, Beer Money, and Desmond Wolf. They did kick Kazarian out, after all. Versus Jeff Hardy and Abyss and Jay Lethal and, and uh, Mr. Anderson. Longest Impact match in years. Actually, it really wasn't. They, they, I, I wrote that. You're right. It started, they started 20 minutes left on the show and ended up, they still had about 10 minutes left for the main event That's thing. True. So I wrote they that got down. a decent amount of time. I wrote that when it started thinking it would go the rest of the way. I was wrong. So they had a, they had a good long match. You know they did here that I just found so annoying? And, and I, I, in a different era, I'd have ranted and raved, but I just don't even care anymore. Chelsea's out there. <laughs> At the last pay per view, Abyss won Chelsea for 30 days. Right. Okay. The 30 days ends on Sunday. Mm -hmm. This was the last impact of the 30 day period. They did not do a single vignette. No. They did not do a. I'm not. They didn't just do one vignette, everyone. They did not do a single vignette. No vignettes. I have never seen a stipulation that was so poorly. I, in fact, I can't even say it was poorly followed up on because it was not followed up on at all. She went to the ring with the Miz and looked sad. The most follow-up we got was at the end of this match. There was actually it was a good match, especially the the end as we got the hot tag and everybody hit a move. It was it was awesome. The 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 two minute segment where everybody hit a move on each other was great. And finally, Nigel laid out Abyss with a lariat and begged Chelsea to give him a chair. She was very hesitant to do so. She took a long-ass time. By the time he got it, Abyss punched the chair into his face for not the finish. No, that was the move. Instead, they did this whole big thing built around the finish. It was not the finish. And then Jay Lethal did a dive, and uh, AJ caught him and style clashed him for the pin. My first thought was, why in the cocksuck did they do that? To my knowledge. I had to Google it to discover that these two men are actually having a match at the pay-per-view. Are they? Yes. I did not know that until you said so right now. That's because I had to fucking Google it. Because the announcers did not make mention of this. It was not a key part of the storyline here. It was just a seemingly random finish after they'd actually done an angle at the end of this tag match. So these people have no idea what they're doing. No. Which well, was proven this first. Do you have anything to say about the tag match? No, it was really good. All right, I'll move on. All right. So after the commercial, there was more. Sting was beating up RVD backstage. This was one of those insufferable segments where they're backstage brawling. Sting is beating the shit out of RVD. He beats on him. 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 
He beats on him. And then suddenly, RVD makes a comeback. And he beats on Sting. And he beats on him. And he beats on him. And he beats on him. I left the room. I went to do other things. I was gone for five minutes. I came back. And what did I see when I came back five minutes later? Sting had turned the tables again. <laughs> By he the way, beat on RVD. While you were gone for five minutes, I was fast forwarding. He, oh, you've got to be kidding they, me. This was legit ten minutes of Sting and Rob Van Dam brawling. They brawled and they brawled and they brawled and they brawled. And finally, Sting won the brawl. And then what did he do to set up the pay-per-view on Sunday? Why? He took the belt that he had stolen from RVD and he gave it back. I swear to God, everyone, that was the end of the show. Why, in God's name, we should buy this pay-per-view for this match? I have absolutely no idea. I've already seen them fight. I could take a fucking calculus class, and I would have a better understanding of what's fucking going on than what's going on on this program, and their, their, this profound... Booking theory leading us to supposedly wanting to watch this fucking match on pay-per-view. In fact, leading us to want to watch this pay-per-view. I never wanted to see these two guys within a thousand miles of each other after this fucking brawl. These they're, people have no idea what they're doing. Have we ever said that before on this show? <laughs> this, this may be the worst built pay-per-view ever. Oh, no. Until you just announced... I know they've done worse. Until you just announced Jay Lethal and AJ Styles... Which they do not announce on the show. Well, they may have during that Slammiversary package we gave up on. <laughs> they did a poor job. Yeah. I was not aware of a single match in that show I wanted to see. I can't think of one. I can't well, I can't think of any of the matches. <laughs> I cannot think of a single match on this show except that main event. So Impact sucked. Yeah. But, again, who cares? Who cares? It sucked for we, eight years. We're in hell. Amazingly, it's probably going to suck for eight more. <laughs> This is like the movie monster that just won't die. When you when you started the show and you started talking about five years, I get, I don't know, <laughs> I get sort of, I, I start looking for a way out. You know, what can I do? Let me talk a little bit about my birthday here, because I am turning 35 years old. Some of the, I mean, all the people that are in charge of this program are older than me. You know, these are people in their 40s. <laughs> Vince Russo is like in his 50s. I just can't imagine going to bed every night and waking up every morning and just knowing how incompetent that I am. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Eight years. <laughs> eight years. To have been a failure for eight years. I mean, do they really deceive themselves into thinking that this is a big success? Maybe they do. Maybe that's, I, yes. Maybe that's at least what I, they I, do. I am convinced at least Dixie Carter does. She thinks she has a good show, and uh, if she does not think she's a success, she, she may not think it's a success, but, but I'm sure she thinks it's inevitable that they will succeed. I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to say that like I'm the biggest success in the entire world, but after five years, things are going pretty well around this website. I think we've done a pretty good job. Not just me, obviously, but everyone involved in it. Even you've done a good job, Vinny. Once in a while. People like the Brian and Vinny show. People listen to the free Brian and Vinny show, and they sign up. They've been doing it now for five years. We're still reading shout-outs about people that signed up because they liked the free Brian and Vinny show. Keep in mind, we got signups this week after Tuesday's Brian and Vinny show. That show was horrible. (laughs) That show. Wow. Well, no, apparently it wasn't. People, those, those are people are going to be disappointed by the show. Signing up. I don't know. I, I just, it's kind of sad to me, really, as I as I reach 35 years old. To think of these people that are 50 years old and this is their legacy. They ran TNA. <laughs> God damn, I'd have quit so long ago. I, I just, I just, I don't have the, I don't know what it is. Like, the lack of self-esteem, or I don't know what it is. I just don't have it in me to be associated with such failure for so long as these people do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's my speech for today, everybody. (laughs) That's beautiful, Brian. As you get older, everybody, just do the best you can. Just do the best you can and try and get up every day and not be full of shit. That's my advice to everybody as I turn 35 years old. You've been eating your fortune cookies again, haven't you? (laughs) No. I just... 
I think about these things sometime as I as I age here. To the back! We're going to recap the TNA Slammiversary pay-per-view here. This shouldn't take long. Your average TNA show. A bunch of guys worked really hard. The matches were put together poorly in many cases. The show was put together poorly. It resulted in a crowd not caring. It's the usual frustrating stuff from TNA, as we'll get into here. I don't know. It bored the hell out of me. It, it just... The very first problem was it opened with Kurt Angle and Kazarian. Now, if you've been in wrestling for a month, it should be patently obvious that you don't open a pay-per-view with one of the best matches on the show and then have the guys do a match with 8 million near falls like you're you're doing a main event and then expect everybody else on the show to follow it. If this show would have gone in reverse, we'd have been talking. But no... They opened up with Kurt Angle and Kazarian. They had a really good match. I gave it three and a quarter stars. I was not blown away by it, largely because it was the opener. They didn't really have the crowd for a lot of it because nobody believed that Kazarian was beating Kurt Angle. Kurt went out there, did the Kurt Angle match he does every time. They did a bunch of near falls, and then they actually kept doing near falls. They did near fall after near fall after near fall. Kicked out of everything under the sun, and finally... Kazarian tried to get the ropes as Angle went for the ankle lock. Angle pulled him back into the middle. Sitter to the leg, got the submission. This caused some fucking woman to scream at the top of her lungs repeatedly for about five straight minutes. Drove me nuts. But good match. Crowd reactions hurt it. Overkill is an opener. And nobody on the show was able to follow it. And especially when you have a main event of RVD and Sting where, first off, it's a style clash. Rob Van Dam and Sting are not going to have a a match where they work really, really well together. You're not going to have a whole bunch of near falls and that sort of thing. And so to open up with a match like that and then close with an RVD and Sting style match, it just basically shows a company that has no idea what they're doing. Which is the story of TNA over the past eight years. So welcome to Slammiversary. Yeah, I got here in the middle of the match, so I cannot... uh criticize the entire thing. I can say what I saw looked pretty good, but there was a point where, I, I, as you noted, the we started doing near falls and, and then kept doing near falls. Specifically, Kaz hit his reverse pile driver thing, the over-the-shoulder dealy, and he dropped Angle right in his head, and we all screamed. And uh, I don't think the crowd believed Kaz was going to win, but they did count along and get into it. And then a minute later, he was still on offense and was trying to get near falls off of clothes lines. Yeah. It failed. And it and, and it did uh it did get the biggest reaction probably the entire show and left uh left the fans not caring about what came next. Doug Williams and Brian Kendrick for the X title probably would have worked together if Brian Kendrick hadn't been doing a bunch of TV shows with some weird wacky heelish character because Doug Williams is also a heel and we ended up having two heels out there. The fans had to choose who they were going to like. They started to get into Brian Kendrick because he played the babyface in peril, which kind of kills whatever character they were working on television. But they had a three-star match. It was a good match. The finish was great as they did their usual near falls and such. And then Kendrick went for something off the top. Williams shoved him off, hit the tornado DDT for the pin. The key here being that he used a high-flying flippy-doo to get the win after burying the X Division for using moves like that for, for weeks and months. And... You cannot tell me that the people that put this match together were the same people that put everything else together in this show. I would bet dimes to dollars that Doug Williams put this match together because it was clearly put together by somebody who had a fucking clue. Yes. Three stars. Not only did the finish make sense with the story they want to tell, but as I mentioned in the show leading up to this, we had the Homicide Kendrick match with Williams on commentary, and it seemed to be three heels all feuding with each other. So he came in here with two heels, and... Williams was smart enough to ground Kendrick almost immediately with bow and arrows and similar holds so that when Kendrick made his big flippy comeback, everyone cheered. So, yes, Doug Williams was, in fact, smart. Um, You still liked him more than I did. I went two and a half, but it was good. I may have underrated it now that I think about it. As I look at the rest of the show here, we had Christy interviewing Eric and the former Brooke. This is awesome. Still in a skirt, of course, covering up her best asset. Not only that, but she's usually facing the camera anyway. Yeah. So Bischoff said he had no idea what Sting was doing of late, which is apropos since they no usually one have does. no idea what they're doing with him. So he put over RVD as a great champion, said he was excited for tonight's battle. 
That was the last we saw Vera Bischoff on this show. I, I don't think it's a good idea when your top challenger has mysterious motivations. Yes. You want characters people can get behind because they know what they're fighting for, not confusion. Madison Rain and Roxy for the knockouts title. Roxy ended up getting busted open early. They did a promo where Madison basically said, and Madison, I don't know what happened here, but Madison took the mic and she began to speak, and my God, did these people hate her. It's like almost a, a, this was like the TNA version of Vicky Guerrero here when she spoke. They hated every word that came out of her mouth. She explained that, she explained that Roxy had been popping in and out for the last two years. The beautiful people had been carrying the company. She basically said, why am I putting everything on the line here and you're putting nothing on the line? You, you returned, you immediately got a title shot. Why don't you put something on the line like your career? And so Roxy said, okay. Her career on the line tonight, no build. Literally zero build. Let me, let me say something. Not even here. a promo before the match. Well, let me just say one thing here. Okay. If you would have announced in advance that it was going to be Madison versus Roxy, title versus career, how many buys would you have added to this show? Probably zero. Zero. Okay, I understand that. I'm not pretending like if you would have announced this in advance, you would have you would have added a whole bunch of buys to this show. However, it's always better to presume you are going to have success than to presume you are going to fail. I know and everybody knows that if you announce this in advance, not a single extra person is going to buy the show. But don't assume that. Why don't you think positive and go, maybe if we announce this in advance, we'll actually have a lot of people buying the show. Seems like a good idea to me. If you can get one extra person to buy the show, isn't that worth it? You think? If you sell literally one buy, it's worth doing it on TV. Now, granted, this may have been a very last-minute thing. In fact, I think it was that Roxy showed up and they, they broke the news to her that she was done. But still, I will take them to task because even if this was a very last-minute thing, way to go. Yeah. <laughs> she showed up at the building and you decided this was going to be your last day. That's still indicative of poor planning and poor a planning. shitty run company. Yes. So they had a match. Actually, no. They they did the mic work and then Roxy hit her. I'm sorry. Roxy said she'd accept the challenge and Madison hit her with the mic and busted her open hard way. Roxy was bleeding everywhere, just leaking, gushing blood. They did their entire match anyway. It was actually, per TNA women's standards these days, it was actually a pretty good match. Sure. I gave it two stars. Me too. Roxy, covered in blood, ended up uh, making her big comeback, and Madison um, rolled outside after the voodoo drop. Roxy went to get her, came back in, Ro Madison hit her finish for the pin, and uh, then they carted Roxy off as she wept, and she has now retired from pro wrestling to go into uh, Schumer. <laughs> what does that say about Shimmer then? Well, it's pro wrestling. I, I, I should have I should have said she is retired from sports entertainment to get into pro wrestling. She's just retired, left TNA to get into wrestling. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was a it was a fine match uh, for a while last year. We got a, a, you're basically an, uh, I mean, above average for the TNA women, but about an average impact match, about four minutes. I guess I won't complain. We had Bubba Ray and Jesse Neal, teacher versus student, supposedly. Bubba came out, asked Devon to come out. Cut this promo about how he was really sorry. He'd been acting like a bully and a douchebag. He apologized to Jesse. He apologized to Shannon. He said that Jesse was really a hero. And then they all went to leave like there was not going to be this match that they'd build. And as they got on the ramp, of course, Bubba turned on Jesse, punched him in the face, threw him in the ring. And then Bubba commanded security to come out and make sure Devon and Shannon did not get into the ring. A true great douchebag. Unfortunately, then they had a boring match. Bubba gave him a whole bunch of chops, hit him a long time. Jesse made a comeback, and suddenly, as he's making a comeback, who should come through the crowd but Tommy Dreamer? ECW fans, or uh, ECW chants here in 2010. Bubba was distracted for a great length of time, and then we had your usual stupid TNA booking in the sense that Bubba was distracted by Tommy Dreamer, and so you would expect that Jesse Neal would immediately roll him up for the pin. No. Bubba is distracted by Tommy Dreamer for an extended length of time. 
He turns around. Jesse Neal is charging at him. He sidesteps Jesse Neal. Jesse runs in the corner like a goddamn idiot. Mm -hmm. Bubba goes up top, tries the senton, misses, and then Jesse Neal pins him with a spear. So Bubba got beat by an idiot. You could not just spear the guy as he's distracted? Yes. No. Everything has to be more complicated, and it made both guys look worse. Star and a half. I also like that the uh, you know the story here is that Bubba is the mean, evil bully, and Jesse is the uh, uh, you know the, the the guy you like, the up and coming young star, and they agree to make peace beforehand. Except that means there is no match. So as they leave, the crowd boos, and then when Bubba turns on Jesse, everyone cheers because now they get to see a fight. Way to go, TNA. Now I know somebody's gonna say, well, Brian, it was better this way because the way they did it, Jesse actually pinned Bubba. It wasn't a result of, of Bubba being distracted. If that's the case, why did you have distraction then? There's no way to justify this finish except these people did not know what they were doing. Chris interviewed Hernandez about the match with Morgan. Morgan, of course, if you recall, was taken out on a stretcher on the last show. Apparently he's fine now. He came out with a neck brace on, did a promo For about... The third match in a row, we had someone come out and talk. Yep. He did a pre-match promo about how he was hurt. He could not wrestle. He had a doctor's note. He gave the doctor's note to the referee. He said, don't worry, I'll be back. I'm a quick healer. So as he starts heading to the back, Hernandez's music hits. He comes out. He takes the neck brace off uh, off, off, uh, Morgan. He throws him in the ring. The ref tosses the piece of paper from the doctor away and just rings the bell. In the hell was the point <laughs> yes. of all of this pre-match They're just bullshit. going to have a match anyway. It meant absolutely nothing. So they have a match. I give it a star. Hernandez sold for a while. He made a comeback for a while. Finally, as Hernandez is beating on Morgan. And by the way, as soon as Morgan had his neck brace torn off and he, he got some heat, he immediately stopped selling. He was not hurt at all. So he's, in fact, a quick healer, as he noted. Anyway, uh, Hernandez was beaten on Morgan. Ref told him to stop. Hernandez grabbed the ref, threw him down for a DQ. And Hernandez was about to boot Morgan's head into the ring post after the match when uh, the ref leaped in the way like a fool, took the bullet, and was killed. And Matt Morgan ran to the back. The referees came down to check on uh, Brian Hebner. He sold it like his shoulder had been separated. One star. There was a point in this match where I was, as I noted, bored. And I looked around, and we had people over for the show. And uh, the people we had, you were thinking around on your computer. Someone else is in the kitchen with their back to the screen. Other people had actually just left the room. This is That's this match in a nutshell. And the finish was stupid as Hernandez was running wild and threw the ref down for no reason. And uh, then they tried to do the thing at the end where the ref got kicked. I think Morgan was supposed to pull the ref in the way. I, I don't know if the ref was supposed to get kicked in the head, but this about sucked. I give this a dud. Nothing good about it. And then, immediately after this, Hogan starts doing a promo about how no man should try to end another man's career. And I had left the room momentarily, and I came back to hear him doing this promo. And, of course, I immediately thought he must be talking about Hernandez and Matt Morgan. Because Hernandez nearly had his career ended by Matt Morgan after having his head kicked into the post. And then Matt Matt Morgan tried to end his career by kicking his head into the post and vice versa. I'm sorry, Hernandez tried to kick Morgan. They both tried to end each other's career. They tried to end each other's career. No, that was not what Hulk Hogan was talking about. He was talking about how mean mean Sting was for pulling Jeff Jarrett's shoulder out of the socket. Yeah. Because you remember on Impact, Jeff Jarrett had his shoulder in a sling. He said he wouldn't be back for a long time. A long time, everyone. So anyway, this was what it was. Then we had Desmond Wolf and Abyss in a Monsters Ball match. I gave it a star. I don't even know why. I guess because the guys worked hard. They did not work smart. This match was, again, put together by, I can't even Rocks. say monkeys. I think Rocks is our new favorite. I, I went to the zoo on my birthday, and I saw monkeys. And it I, I would be, I cannot bring myself to... To accuse monkeys of booking impact, it is it is uh, it is unfair. Are there other stupider animals you saw, such as perhaps a tree sloth? There was that uh, the penguins at uh, at Universal in Florida that, that swam around and sw- swam into the glass repeatedly. Those those animals likely, in fact, they were down there in Orlando. So it's very likely that the penguins at Sea World in Orlando are in fact putting these matches together. I have no better answer. They had a hardcore match. And first off, Desmond comes down to the ring with Chelsea. 
because the month is over. Abyss won Chelsea for an entire month in which they did absolutely not a single vignette. Yes, there was they no point. They didn't further the angle at all. She just came to the ring with him for four shows and then went back with Desmond. So she comes out with Desmond Wolf. They have this hardcore match. There's a barbed wire board. There's some other stuff. They hit each other with cans. Chelsea, I believe, was appalled. I There was a look on her face that I interpreted it as... She was appalled. They cut to her about 47 times during this match. I don't think her expression ever changed. No. I, I think Which she... Which begs the question, why are you cutting to her for reaction shots? She... Because she's a great actor, I guess, for TNA standards, they believe. Anyway, she looked exactly the same every time they cut to her. Broken glass ended up in the ring. They brawled up on the stage. This was one of those matches where there were long stretches with absolutely no heat. Desmond took a choke slam through the a gimmick part of the stage, and there was, like, no reaction whatsoever. And then Abyss started dragging him to the ring. And then suddenly, like a dozen guys started a This Is Awesome chant. And they were they quickly fizzled out, and then there was more absolute silence. They took each other into the ring. They did more stuff. Abyss fell onto a barbed wire board and got his arms all ripped up, and he was bleeding everywhere. Desmond... Gave him a cane shot, and Abyss fell face first into the glass, and then he's cut up again. They cut back to Chelsea, who had the exact same look on her face she'd had the entire match. Desmond finally demanded her purse. She gave it to him, and it was empty. He's like, where are the brass knucks? She pulls him out of her pocket. She throws him at Desmond. They go over his head. Abyss grabs him, punches Desmond, gives him the black hole slam, one, two, three. Which, of course, begs the question, you had garbage cans... Kendo sticks, glass, barbed wire boards, a choke slam through the stage, yet brass knucks were the most dangerous thing in this match. Sure. Who writes this? I don't know. Well, penguins. Penguins. Penguins, the only answer. This match was, in some ways, I wrote down at one point, this is the worst wrestling can be right here. In hindsight, this is a little harsh. But it was very terrible wrestling. We had first of all, of all the weapons they threw in the ring, they didn't have a necktie. This week of all weeks, there should have been a necktie thrown in there. We, we talked about Chelsea and her non-reaction shots. Desmond was going through the weapons. When he reached in the trash can, he pulled out a teddy bear wrapped in barbed wire. He was embarrassed to be a part of this shindig. No one in the crowd cared. Then Abyss beat him up, took the bear, and he gave it to Chelsea perhaps as a gift. You had 30 days with this girl where she was your prisoner, and you didn't make your move until now? Yeah, or maybe he did and got rejected or warned up to her, but we don't know because we got no vignettes. So, yes, Desmond was choked slammed through the wood. There was actually a great camera shot because the camera was below the stage, so you couldn't see the stage collapse. And they actually thought perhaps Desmond just got choked slammed on an unmoving piece of the stage. Then they cut to another shot. You saw he went through plywood with padding underneath. And I, as you noted, a good 15 seconds passed before a week. This is awesome chance started. That made me angry. Abyss went into the barbed wire. was not the finish. He hit shock treatment. That was not the finish. You could literally hear one guy clapping. This took a bump into glass. That was not the finish. Then, yeah. And then, then Des, this is when Desmond demanded the purse. The purse. Yeah. Because Mike from the explained, that is where Chelsea keeps the knuckles. Yeah. Why don't I just ask her for the brass knuckles? <laughs> and then you can still do your same stupid finish. Everything has to be more complicated. Yes. There had to be a spot where she tossed him a purse, and then it turned out to be empty. Yes. Fuck you! <laughs> I wow. Went a, a quarter star only because at the very, very end when uh, Bisc clobbered him with the Nux and then hit the back black hole slam, people were into that. Other than that, this infuriated me. I wrote stupid, senseless, nonsensical, hardcore shit. And I actually should have just wrote horse shit. As opposed to putting the hardcore in there. I don't want anyone to ever do hardcore again. I want to take that term out of wrestling vocabulary. AJ and Jay Lethal, three and a half stars. They worked really hard. They had a hell of a match. Unfortunately, the crowd, we've talked about the crowd. There were, again, long stretches where they were doing moves and nobody cared. The one thing, actually, that almost made me want to take a quarter star off was, at the beginning of the match... AJ was going to do a baseball slide, but I don't know if Jay lifted up the wrong leg or what happened, but AJ slides right into his ankle, and Jay Lethal grabs his ankle, and he starts selling. And at first I was like, 
Did they fuck that up, or, or was that what they were trying to do, and, and now he's going to work over his leg? Well, literally 10 seconds later, they did the same spot and another baseball slide, and they did it right and continued on wrestling. And These guys have been wrestling for a long-ass time. Yes. And it's not like they've been wrestling for a long-ass time like Daphne, and they're still really bad. They've been wrestling for a long-ass time, and they're great wrestlers. Why do people repeat botch spots? Well, especially when you repeat it ten seconds later. It's it's one thing if like you botched a spot that was important for some reason. Like I don't know. I don't know what would be so important that you would have to repeat it. But suffice to say, the baseball slide spot that they repeated in this match was absolutely unnecessary. It it added absolutely nothing to the match when they got it right. It did nothing but reveal to the world that they had fucked up earlier. So yes. that annoyed me. The rest of the match. Great stuff. They uh, these guys obviously work very well together. They they did some their usual spots at the end. Flair was at ringside being great. Uh, they traded figure fours. Um, I must take exception somewhat to the finish as well as AJ went to. The more you think about this match, the more you will find a nitpick. Yeah, maybe maybe I overrated this. AJ went to climb up to the middle rope, but his leg gave out. And so he tried to get in, and he was all wobbly. And he went for a sunset flip, and lethal kind of sort of turned it into a northern lights suplex for the pin. AJ's shoulder was up. Um, I guess his finish might have been a little better if Jay Lethal had had him in a figure four for longer than approximately ten seconds. That would have helped. Leading to the finish. Well, so, also, I mean, so AJ, okay, Jay misses his dive. He misses the top rope elbow. AJ follows the pay kick, and he goes to go up top. Great. So then his knee gives out, takes a wacky face first buck in the priest's first bump in the turnbuckle, and then he just climbs again anyway. Yeah. What a dipshit. He's he's got to At least he's the heel tenacity. being stupid. Tenacity. So yeah, um I went two and a half. Yeah, I, that is that's probably underrating it. There was they went a long time and it was mostly just back and forth and not boring. Um and then they worked Jay's uh leg in the figure four, and then we talked about the finish already. Don't ever need to see it again, but it was certainly a good match, particularly on this show. Let's meet in the middle somewhat and call it three and a quarter. Sure, that, I'll go with that. There was also, it was preceded by a Rob Van Dam promo in which Christy Hemme stated, The internet is buzzing. I thought they were talking about Danielson. They may have been. Rob said he had to win not just for himself, but for all the fans of TNA. And then for the second time on the show said he doesn't care about Sting's agenda. Bischoff, well, I, I guess I should clarify. Bischoff said he didn't know what Sting was talking about. Rob said he doesn't care about Sting's agenda, just like other fans don't know and don't care about it either. Yeah. Sting did a promo. I think we lost. God sound. muted it. His lips moved. No words came out. That's fine. Then we got a Jeff Best Hardy promo on the show, probably. Jeff Hardy, Mr. Anderson promo. Which sadly, God did not mute. The uh, <laughs> I should just read Dave's report. Dave simply stated, quite factually, they are a new team with the regular name of the Extreme Enigmatic Assholes. Yes. Because when you have comedy handed to you like this, you don't need to add anything to it. No. So we had the Extreme Enigmatic Assholes against Beer Money. I didn't even watch most of it, I'll be honest. <laughs> it looked fine. Let me tell you about this match. Another one of those matches that just put together by idiots. They, My favorite spot. My favorite spot. They get the heat on Anderson for a while and breaks down into a four-way. Anderson got sent outside. Robert Roode is laying in the middle of the ring, and Jeff Hardy hits him with the big senton, seemingly for the finish. So as Jeff Hardy is about to pin Robert Roode, James Storm pulls the ref out of the ring. Okay, fine. So the ref gets pulled out of the ring, and he turns around, and James Storms points at Mr. Anderson and says, he did it. Now, if you think about this for more than a second, you obviously conclude, why would the ref believe that Mr. Kennedy broke up a pin that his partner was going to make to win the match? Right? Uh, it makes sense to me. Well, James Storm accused Mr. Anderson of pulling the ref out of the ring, and the ref, of course, believed him. The ref said, hey, this Anderson fellow is breaking up his own win. Yeah. Right. There's nothing like making your referees look like the biggest, stupidest motherfuckers on the earth, and, and TNA does all the time. So then they go to work on Jeff. Anderson gets the hot tag. I will say. And by the way, speaking of the hot tag, they did not even show the hot tag. 
The director had a close-up of Mr. Anderson's hand. And the next thing you know, Anderson has gotten the tag and he's getting in the ring. Way to build the drama. Yeah, they suck. But I, I will say this had the most heat of anything on the show due almost entirely to Jeff Hardy. Yes. And people still love him and still love chanting his name. So I gave this three and a quarter stars. That works. Aside from the referee bullshit, which infuriated me, the the rest of the match, they, they worked very hard. And, and it's very hard to have a bad match with beer money. True. Although Mr. Anderson tried all he could. <laughs> he did a lot. It, he, did, he got a hot tag. He made his comeback. And everything was going fine. And it was one of those bits where everything was going fine. Then it's a little less fine. Then you've seen it all. Then you keep doing moves. Then the baby faces finally won. And Anderson also ended up bleeding somehow. Yeah. So, sucks to be him. RVD and Sting for the title. Between the end of the last match and the beginning of this match, I went upstairs and took a shower. Came back down. Match still hadn't started yet. It's still the beginning of Had to have been a good 15 minutes of, of, of time that, that nothing happened. I felt much better after the shower, by we, the way. We need to start taking showers regularly during TNA pay-per-views. Yeah. So, not together. They ended up no, in the no, ring. No, and uh, Sting worked him over for a while in a T-shirt, mind you. Actually, I must cut you off. They did not. Uh, did you say they ended up in the ring after they brawled outside? They brawled outside for like five minutes. Yeah. Just they, they they spent more time brawling in the crowd than Roxy got in her career-ending match. So they're in the ring. They're brawling. RVD makes a comeback. They were working this like a raw TV match at the 9:45 p.m. mark. Ref took a bump. Now. If you're going to have a ref bump in the main event, fine. Don't book a fucking ref bump earlier in the show. You, would you think, assholes. You would think. They, re- they book a ref bump, and who should come out but Jeff Jarrett. The same Jeff Jarrett that this past Thursday was in a sling and was not going to wrestle again for a long time. He is already healed. He came down completely fine. He beat up Sting with the bat, hit him in the jaw with it, RVD hit the Rolling Thunder. For not the finish. For not the finish. Uh, again. Sting kicked out. They did the interference, and then just kept on wrestling for a while. Crowd died. It was, yeah, and, and Rob eventually hit the frog splash. Actually, no. Sting got hit in the face with a bat and hit with the Rolling Thunder. It was not the finish. And the next thing you know, he's back in control. Sure. He went for the Stinger splash. RVD booted him. Hit the frog splash for the pin. The ref counted super slow. Sting sort of kicked out at three, but not enough because they still called it the finish. Rob was screaming at the referee to count faster. You're making both of us look stupid. Oh, this match. I, I, I it was all, exactly what you'd expect. All, it was Sting at 51 years old and Rob Van Dam. What all, do you fucking expect? All I could think was that what do you, it was in the way a perfect main event for this show. Slammiversary. So they bring eight years of the same bullshit in pay-per-view main events. Actually, it was it was fitting because the the main event of the Slam Anniversary show was Jeff Jarrett coming down to cause interference mm-hmm. in every single Jeff Jarrett main event style book match you've ever seen. Yeah, which this was. So happy anniversary, TNA. Here's to eight more years. Hey, so the big surprise that Dixie was hyping ended up being Tommy Dreamer. Yeah, just going back over some of her tweets. Made recently on June 10th. June 9th, which she says got a nice surprise for Slammiversary. That's what got everyone talking. June 10th. Hard to believe Samoa Joe made his TNA debut on Slammiversary five years ago. He's been getting a great response on recent live events. In five years, that's what he, Joe has climbed to. Mm-hmm. House show guy. Note here about talking to President Kevin K. Okay, her last post about this was got a nice surprise for Slammiversary. Then... At 6.30 a.m., been up for hours, so excited I can't sleep. TNA is about to change forever. Then, just got off the phone with Spike President Kevin K. He's all in and agrees this will change TNA on every level. Some notes about racing, uh, the World Cup, more racing, the Fan Fest daily, a photo shoot. And then, to clarify, I will not be making an announcement about how TNA will change forever. You will just see for yourselves in the coming weeks. Yep. Uh, then, immediately thereafter, however, there is still a nice surprise for tonight's anniversary pay-per-view. It's a good thing this woman's pretty. Yeah. Because she's dumb. To the back! All right, let's uh, do Impact here. I didn't see the first segment or most of it, so uh, go. A recap the show from last week you never watched. We missed, apparently, a three-way number one contenders bout between Jeff Hardy, Mr. Anderson, and Abyss that ended in a triple count-out 
I'm so happy I and skipped that show. And why not? I'm so happy I skipped that show. So then Abyss got mad. That about, he got very mad at the draw. He put Ken Anderson into glass, and he threw Jeff Hardy off the stage. So Hogan came out. He booked a four-way for Victory Road. Those three guys and RVD for the title. Uh, before he get any farther, Abyss came out to his old music. He has dumped the Hulk Hogan theme. Hulk asked him basically what was up. Abyss said they told him to do it. Said they are coming and they will be here sooner than you think. Said there's nothing Hulk or Bischoff or Dixie could do to stop them. And they told him he doesn't need Hulk anymore. Hulk demanded to, to know who they were. Abyss said no. He said he didn't need the colors anymore or the ring. He shoved the ring down Hogan's throat, which was tremendous because Hogan had the mic by his mouth still. We could hear him selling. It was awesome. Uh, so Hulk or Abyss was stopping on Hulk. RVD tried to save. Abyss fought him off. Anderson tried to save. And Abyss fought all of them off. But somehow they saved Hogan. And the three faces ran away from the one big scary heel. Yeah. The three top baby faces yeah. ran for their lives. And this is not like the Motor City Machine Guns and, uh, what is that, Jilly? Well, Eric Young. This is the world champion, his top contender, and the guy who's the figurehead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... We then had a secret secret camera footage. Let me talk about this. All right. Hogan and Bischoff are backstage after commercial, calmly discussing what had just occurred. Yes. Hogan is none the worse for wear. He's not choking to death on the ring that got shoved down his throat. No. And they concluded... He's not even sweating or no. breathing hard. They concluded, well, better move on. <laughs> Life goes on, I believe Eric said. Kidding, I'm kidding. That is the conclusion they had. Yeah. We better move on. <laughs> I... This show sucks. This show, you know how many times on this I wrote this show sucks in this report. I also, like that the hidden camera footage. Now I always thought it was earlier in the day stuff. No, yeah. this, this revealed it is all live. Yeah, they just, got, they just got one shitty camera. Yes, so they just use once in a while for no reason. Velvet so, was Velvet, backstage. The Velvet and Madison were backstage. Madison was making mean jokes about Lacey. Velvet was sad. Madison cut a mean promo on Velvet and told her she should be carried out in a stretcher. Yeah. We missed a week. Don't ask us. Angelina against Velvet. Angelina is ridiculously skinny, almost sickly skinny. Sold for a while, made a comeback, and then grab a chair. Which, of course, is illegal in wrestling. So the ref told her, you can't use that. She puts the chair in the middle of the ring. Actually, even before that. She grabbed a chair, and with this big, heavy, dangerous weapon in her hand, she opted to throw a kick. Yes, she then kicked, she put the chair down. She kicked Velvet, and then she put the put the chair down in the middle of the ring. Now the ref is telling her, "You can't use that. You can't use that. You can't use a chair." So she puts it down in the middle of the ring, leaves it there, and goes to get Velvet. Now does the ref kick the chair out of the ring? Does he get rid of it in any way? No. He just leaves it right there in the middle of the ring while simultaneously telling her, you can't use the chair. That was his exact word. You can't use the chair. The chair just lay there the whole time. Taz, without using these exact words, basically said, move the chair, motherfucker. So, he doesn't. Angelina DDTs her onto the chair. The ref calls for the DQ. On top of all of the stupidity that I just ranted about, Angelina Love could not beat Velvet Sky clean. No. Because, uh, yes. The story is that last week she beat Lacey. This week she beats Madison till she finally gets to the woman's champion. Or this week she beat Velvet. She's going to get to Madison, the woman's champion. Yet she could not beat Velvet Sky? This story was too complicated for them. Or too simple. They needed to have, have her lose by disqualification to Velvet Sky. Jay Leville talked to a man. Yeah. That's, that's the extent of it, everybody. He met a mystery man. They did not identify the man. Nope. Jay talked about mom and dad, so we presumed it was a family member. Then and then he, he told the catering. man to go to catering. That's the extent of it. No identification whatsoever of this man. Maybe he was on last week. I'm going to uh, just read my notes here for the next segment. Eric Young and Kevin Nash walk the hallway. Kevin says he needs to distance distance himself from Scott. Kevin says heat is going to roll down on him. He doesn't want Eric to be a part of it, and they go their separate ways. Yeah. I have absolutely no... I'll read my notes. Another stupid backstage camera segment. I now hate these. 
They don't show you the beginning or the end or whatever is happening. We just get a glimpse of the middle. Half time, it's impossible to figure out what's going on. Nash and Eric were talking about something. Hall was mentioned, as were Eric's shoes. No clue, don't care. Many presume this was their breakup. Hell of a breakup. I have nothing more to add. Okay. No idea. Matt Morgan came out. They showed clips of him interfering in a match between Hernandez and Joe. He talked about a lot of shit about Hernandez. The announcers were sure to point out Hernandez was in Mexico. Morgan said, Morgan, Morgan said he was happy to face Hernandez in a cage match at Victory Road. Said he would beat up Hernandez, then would come back to tell us all he told us so. Homicide ran out, tried to beat him up. Morgan cut him off, and they did the kick in the head sp- uh, spot. I love that when they do this, the victims are trapped. Their heads are stuck against the post like glue. And they it gets move. better. He puts Homicide's head against the post, and he runs and does his jumping kick and drives Homicide's head into the post. Mm-hmm. Now, this was the angle they used to send Hernandez to Mexico for like two months. They wrote him out of storylines with this. Right. When Hernandez got his head kicked into the post, on this same fucking show, I might add, they stopped the show for 15 minutes. They brought out referees, backstage geeks, doctors, a stretcher. The show was over for 15 minutes while they got rid of this guy, this heinous injury. Homicide gets his head kicked into the post in the exact same manner. They went to commercial. We never heard about it again. No. There was no follow-up after commercial. There was no mention of Homicide's status. We never heard about it again. No. They, wait, wait, this when, show sucks. When Hernandez got kicked in the head, the show sucked. When Homicide got kicked in the head... All we got was one line of dialogue from Matt Morgan when he turned to the camera and said, quote, this is going to look like a wet dream compared to what I do to you. I don't want to know what that means. There is no possible way to interpret that that is not distressing. We got another stupid fucking segment with Flair and AJ backstage. This was the best yet. AJ's like, has the package showed up yet? Flair said, I don't want to hear about the package. Don't bring it up again. And then AJ said, he's around here somewhere. I saw him by the go position. Cut away. <laughs> Cut away right there. I just wrote AJ and Flair bicker about a package. Okay, was was there a follow-up to this package anywhere on this show? Yeah. What was it? The action figure. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was the follow-up. That's what this led to. <laughs> Did you just make the show more now? The fact that you followed it up made it worse. This show sucks. <laughs> okay. So, Kazarian versus Jay Lethal. During the match, they cut backstage where we saw Flair and AJ beating up the man who came to visit Jay Lethal earlier. At which point, this is the best part. Taz suddenly screams, That's his brother, Muhammad! <laughs> Well, All right. Before that, he said, who is that? Yes. Then he had no idea who it was, so then he announced this is Brother Muhammad. Now, personally, I think the funny, funniest part about this is that apparently the Mr. and Mrs. Lethal have two sons, and one is named Muhammad, and the other is named Jay. Sure. I think that's a funny pair of names. So, yes, they uh, beat him up for a while. This We were told it was his brother. Had a pretty fun match. Lethal won with a wacky suplex into a neck breaker. Then he went to party with the crowd. Kazarian laid on the apron laughing, and Lethal thought that's odd. And then he showed the big screen where, again, we saw Flair and AJ beating up his brother. Flair said woo a lot. They went back to ringside where Jay Lethal was standing there, looking on disapprovingly. Then he slowly climbed up on the stage. That way we never saw them again. They went to commercial. He didn't run to save his brother. Did he Did he save his brother? We don't know. He... So you're telling me, let me get this straight. <laughs> you're telling me that they beat up Jay Lethal's brother uh-huh. in the middle of the show, right. and Jay Lethal began heading backstage, and we don't know if he ever got there? Oh. So they could still be beating up Mohammed right now. As far as we know, it's entirely possible. It'd be nice if we had some sort of update. 
But well, there's more to come. It would be. There's so much stuff on the show, guys. We don't have time for an update on the status of Mohammed. So, Jeff Jarrett versus Sting. Sting was shown in the rafters. Jarrett went to get him. They started fighting on the stairs. Meanwhile, the real Sting climbed into the ring. So, presumably, this was NWO Sting. Jeff Jarrett was, was uh, being up. So Okay, now stop right there. Yeah. This show was dire. And this is yet another example of that. So, to recap, Jeff was waiting for Sting to come to the ring. Sting did not come to the ring. There was a guy that looked like Sting in the rafters, so Jarrett went after him. He climbed all the way up the stairs. He grabbed this guy. He managed to brawl from the rafters down the stairs, through the arena, and into the ring before he noticed that this guy he was beating up was actually a man in disguise. Mm-hmm. And then when he got to the ring, Sting, the real Sting, hit him with a bat and beat him up. Right. Why didn't Sting just get in the rafters and hit him with the bat when he came up the stairs? I, I don't know. This See, you're... is was is, could there possibly be a more pointless ruse? <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me that Sting wanted to hit Jeff Jarrett with a bat. So he called a friend. <laughs> He went out of his way to get a matching outfit. He had his friend dress up in the outfit and hide in the rafters as a decoy so that Jeff would go up the stairs, grab his friend, beat the shit out yes. of him. At which point he told his friend, Jeff's going to hit you. Don't fight back. Don't fight back. Let him drag you all the way back to the ring, and then then I'll be there with a bat, and I'm going to hit him. Now you're Why actually hate this show. You're actually leaving out perhaps the most impressive part of all An this. An overcomplicated swerve that makes for no absolutely sense. Absolutely no yes. reason. Jeff Jarrett managed to fight, drag this guy from the rafters down to the stage, down the ramp, and throw him into the ring. Never noticing there was another human being in the ring. Yeah. What a dumbass. So then, thankfully, the show turned around. Kurt Angle and Desmond Wolf had an awesome TV match. Oh, they did. Kurt Angle was number nine. He beat Desmond Wolf, so now he's number eight. Chelsea was out there with the Chelsea look on her it face. Was, it was fantastic because Taz tried to talk about say say things like look at look on her face, and then like the very next sentence realized where he lost cause this was. Yeah, Taz is the best part of the show, except for Kurt Angle and Desmond Wolf wrestling. Taz Chelsea looks disappointed. Taz said. I was like, really? She looks exactly the same as she looked the entire match here. There's been no change in facial expression. Yeah, see, he said that, and then they cut to her, and he said, well, not right there. <laughs> so so they had this match. It ruled. Yep. Probably three and a half, maybe even four stars. No, I wouldn't go that far. It was really it good. Was, it was a three and a quarter star match. It was maybe really three good. and a half. Desmond went for the Tower of London angle, Olympic slam, ankle lock. Then Chelsea smiles. She Swear did, yes. We now know she is a human being. She has two facial expressions. Blank and and half smile. So great TV match this was. And they're they're playing up this. And by the way, great follow-up to this Chelsea Abyss storyline. Yes. Abyss won her for a month. They did nothing with it. She went back to Desmond, and then Abyss turned heel. Yes. Way to go, writers. <laughs> writers. Yes. So... We had an Anderson promo backstage getting ready for his match. Said Abyss could use whatever he wanted, including shotguns. Yeah. Okay. He's lucky he didn't. He had, I actually did love this next segment, even though it makes no sense. Douglas Williams was in the ring. Uh, based on what the announcers said, apparently he was ambushed last week by Brian, Brian Kendrick and put in a submission hold. <laughs> so they're having a rematch at the pay-per-view for the title, and apparently... To set up this second title match, the first match was just Doug Williams won clean. Yeah. Convincingly. He had a, he didn't get a roll up, a flash roll up. He had a tornado DDT and won. Yeah. So, he came out here, cut a promo. He said he needed to educate the wrestlers of the X Division, not just on wrestling, but also professionalism and sportsmanship. He called Kendrick out. Kendrick came out. He was very polite and cordial as well. He announced. Cordial. Sure. Is that like rough? Cordial? Cordial. He, uh, gentlemanly. Yes. He was gentlemanly. So he, uh, he announced that there would be an Ultimate X title match at Victory Road that could also end a submission between the two. What? That's what he said. An Ultimate X match that can also end via submission. Yeah. You have to get the X or make your guy tap out. All right. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Why not? So 
He said all this. He was, uh, you know, he was doing it in his usual drug-induced style. And uh, finally, Douglas just said, "Listen, I'm. I know you're using your full spirituality. I know you're trying to lure me or to to, to uh, anger me into attacking you, but I'm better than that. I think we should both walk away now. We'll conclude our affairs on July 11th." So. Kendrick agreed. So Douglas Williams is going to be scaling cables to get an X. Or he can just lack on a submission hold. Or he could just put on a figure four leg lock. Yes. <laughs> so. Why do I watch this show? I don't this know. This show makes me hate wrestling. <laughs> because there's some part of you that must feel guilty about something. Yeah, I have to cover this. This is your penance for whatever crime you've committed. So, after saying they should walk away, Douglas tried to jump Kendrick, but Kendrick cut him off and put on his new submission hold, which is a Cobra Clutch, oh, yeah. which Sergeant Slaughter was using 30 years ago. Bubba was beating up someone. I think Jesse Neal I just made the and Dudley's and Ink Ink are brawling, Yeah. which then got to the next segment. Beer Money versus Shannon Moore in what is apparently the finals of the tag team let tournament. Me, let me talk about this. So, Beer Money and uh, Shannon Moore you, you are, just take this segment. are in the I ring, out. and I had missed last week's show, and I turned to you, and I said, what in the hell are we watching? And you said, direct quote, the finals of a tag team tournament that is also a handicap match. That's what you said! <laughs> as best as I could tell. It may have been the semifinals, actually, in hindsight, but... No, it's the finals. Was it the finals? It was the finals. All right. I don't know. I don't know. It was the Machine Guns did commentary. Tommy Dreamer, Richards, and Raven were in the crowd. And I wrote, and I quote, anything else while we're at it? And sure enough, out came Jesse Neal. And God bless the guy. And I will preface this by saying that when he made the hot tag, the people went nuts. But during the match, when he limped down the stage and got into the corner to wait for the hot tag, no one cared. Nobody cared at all. So we got the hot tag. He ran wild. Storm spat beer into Jesse's face. And uh, <laughs> this was awesome. He spits the beer in his face. And Saban on commentary, as soon as this occurred, said, Well, Jesse ain't making it to the pay-per-view. Which, of course, is what commentators say when a guy's going to kick out. Well, he didn't kick out. He did not make it to the pay-per-view. <laughs> Saban called it. So, yes, somehow... It's going to be beer money versus the machine guns of victory road for the tag titles, and I good. That, uh, that sounds like a great match. I'm, I'm very excited to watch that. I'm happy. Um, the last time I saw this show, which wasn't that long ago, the tag team champions were the band. Yeah, there was no <laughs> addressing here. Of, well, it was addressed last week. You see, I understand we missed a week. The, they, there was no, no they recap here it up at of, all of why they're not the champions now. Nope. There was no explanation of what the Machine Guns did to deserve a title shot. They won it a couple of pay-per-views ago in that Tag Team Ultimate X thing. Oh. No mention of that either. Okay. Nope. nope. Because they kept saying that the winners of this tournament would face the Machine Guns. And I thought, who booked this? But there's a reason. Well, it would have been nice if they would have explained the they, reason. They, they, Luckily, uh, I actually remembered something for once in my life. At least they, they had a credible reason for their story, albeit they did a shitty job of telling the story. So there you go. So backstage, Kazarian and AJ were in their locker room. AJ had a new doll. He was very proud about it. Showed it off to Kazarian. Said, you don't have a doll, do you? He probably will. But he said no. That was that. Yeah. Abyss, Bristol, Ken Anderson, anything goes. They had every weapon on Earth at their disposal, including apparently shotguns. I'm not going to complain about this. Mm -hmm. I know what you're about to say. This was a Falls Count Anywhere match, hardcore rules. Mm -hmm. And all they did was use a chair and brawl at ringside. I was, just going to, I was just going to say that after all this, the finish was Abyss hitting shock treatment and winning. Yes. His secondary finisher. There were no glass, no thumbtacks, which I have no problem with, by the way. But, yes, this was the tamest hardcore match of all time. This was actually like a normal TNA match. Yes. The guys wrestled, and they used some outside-the-ring shit, and the referee didn't care at all. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know why they bothered calling it a hardcore match. She just called it a match. and Because everything has to be more complicated than it is. So then Abyss was still angry. He took uh, Anderson to the stage. They brawled for a bit up there. And Abyss ended up sending him off the stage as well. I paid my penance watching this show, everybody. We're done with this review. 